Now we're ready for general questions on the call of the seminar, any talk. And we have a beginning one, I know, from my colleague here, from the Mistress of the Revels. And would you present your question? Yeah, I've already forewarned you with this question. You gave him Harry Collins. The one about his two sons. Yeah. How awful they were. Yeah. yeah. Ask your question. Is this um, common, or is this something in Greek that you always hear about the sons and the father? And, uh, was there something that happened in Greek history or Roman history that the sons that were more um, compatible with the fathers in an earlier time and less so later, or is there uh, some break? <clears throat> Does decadence come into this? I don't know what exactly the question is. Russell, maybe you should phrase. You know what I'm saying. I think, well, it was in the 5th century in Greece, an age when the the rude, the rude son shall strike the father dead. In short, a decay of filial piety. That, that's, that's my question. Yeah. What I'm really referring to is about two sons mm-hmm. who weren't very um, grateful to their father, and their son, their, their father didn't sound very nice either. Relationship that uh, occurred in those well, I, I don't think we're speaking about an historical reality, but uh, the question of family and and uh, and power. And since uh, the United States doesn't know any examples of uh, nasty fathers who made their money running booze, who got their sons into politics, yeah. and uh, <laughs> the you know, and they behave in outrageous fashions that stretch the Constitution, not to mention the laws of murder. Uh, since we don't have that, it's hard for us, and we think that you know, the Greeks and the Romans are the only place where uh, ambitious uh, fathers bring up uh, ambitious sons who are indifferent to the moral laws that govern the rest of society. But I think it would be possible if one knew enough modern history to find conceivable parallels for that kind of misbehavior. Certainly, in terms of decadence, a leadership which um, not only doesn't live up to the rules of ordinary morality, but in fact explicitly repudiates them, is a leadership that is going to lead its country into decadence. And Severus was one of these people who would have made a lot of money writing realistic books about politics in our own day had he not been um, emperor. And the lessons his sons learned were lessons that in the short term allow you to be real powerful, but in the long term break down the, the real moral relationships that keep one another together. They no sooner did the old man pass away, but then Caracalla killed Gita, and uh, we still have a monument put up there in Rome, uh, very close to the Circus Maximus. You have to look a little bit for it. It's sort of around a corner. And there is um, their mother, uh, Julia Domna, Caracalla, and this blank space. <laughs> They just chipped Gita away after he'd been killed. And uh, sort of going through the Soviet encyclopedia, blacking out the references to Trotsky or whoever it is that, that is there, uh, so-called Damnatio Memoriae. Um, and a, a brutal person like Caracalla, as successful as he was for a short time, didn't last very long himself. And the lessons that were learned were lessons which led to a period of chaos. So I regret to say that if it was only true in the ancient world, we'd be real lucky, but there's no reason to think it. I might add some comments there. Um, Chris, Chris just mentioned Julia Domna, the mother of those two sons. And I once saw Julia Domna. Uh, she was in the restaurant called uh, La Cisterna in Trastevere in Rome. A, a young woman, the same... Uh, Corfure, famous Corfure, and the uh, uh, bust, and exactly the same features. Beautiful young woman, Julia Down all over again, sitting here in the restaurant, um, <laughs> which is one of my instances of the survival of the Roman physical types in modern Rome. It's amazing how you'll still find them there, people of ancient uh, profile and uh, even carriage, Corfure, and everything. Of course, she probably was conscious of the resemblance and so had the same hairstyle, uh, but they, they're still there. Well, so. Uh, in, in general, of course, the uh, ages of decadence uh, show a breakup of the family, of, of loyalties. Uh, formerly, in, in, in the ages of uh, vigorous accomplishment, ordinarily the father and mother had great authority. In the Roman family, they both had great authority. Uh, the famous uh, Roman matrons, such as Cordelia, the mother of the Gracchi, and countless other examples. 
strong woman uh, who is revered by her sons and obeyed by them. Well, the, the most famous example is that of Coriolanus uh, of Plutarch and Shakespeare, uh, who after being mistreated by the Republic and goes over to the enemy, to the Volscians, and uh, marches against Rome and is about to take the city. Um, but his mother intervenes and says, don't behave that way, son. And, uh, and so, all right, he commands, he goes back and, to his death among the Volscians, and now regard him as a double traitor and put him to death. A premier example of obedience to the Roman matron. Do what you do as your mother tells you. No matter how great you are and what your risks are, do what your mother says. Whatever it is, you obey. Uh, in the case of the Roman father, the Roman father had power of life and death arbitrarily over his son. And he could order him put to death without any challenge in courts of law, if he so decided, at least in the early republic, a common felon to, custom felon to decay, but that was the original authority of the father. The great authority of the Roman part of Familius. And that's why the Romans later on, the Roman moralists are so shocked at the decay of this authority and, and uh, disrespect uh, for parents that arises and the uh, betrayal of them. Then I came, of course, on another phenomenon, uh, touched upon incidentally by, by uh, Polybius in the passage I quoted, um, the fact that uh, emperors in Rome frequently were homosexuals and uh, had no children. The great Hadrian, a man of the greatest talents and abilities and intelligence, was nevertheless a notorious homosexual and uh, uh, had no children. And uh, thus it is when Marcus Aurelius uh, had many children by his uh, Empress Faustina and was highly praised for the moralist. What an amazing man! He actually condescends to have children. He's an emperor, and here he is, he actually brings up children, and he pays attention. It didn't turn out well, it's not Commodus, he was his son, was a horrible monster of an emperor. Nevertheless, he did uh, bring children into the world. Uh, and uh, there we have the interesting case of Faustina, uh, the empress, who, uh, according to the uh, uh, to historians full of scandal, was a uh, promiscuous, licentious woman, and yet seems again of a, of a certain uh, high dignity and uh, confl conflicting accounts. As to actually what she was, she always had the affection of her husband, a man, of course, of the highest principle. And there still stands the Roman Forum, the temple of Marcus Aurelius and Faustina, uh, built in honor of the two of them. And uh, except, well, Comus didn't turn out well. She did rear her children. She seems to have been a mother of some care and so on. So the testimony varies uh, as to the uh, character of these people. But certainly the, uh, uh, the decay of the family is marked uh, by the lack of, nat of natural heirs of uh, sons uh, to the emperors. In the case of, uh, of uh, Septimius Severus, uh, at least the, uh, they were natural children, two evil sons. They were born of his own body. But the more common custom was adoption, for one reason or another, uh, of uh, persons that their predecessors thought would make tolerable emperors or who, for one reason or another, they favored, uh, sometimes for immoral reasons, as their successors. Well, we're open for questions. Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Kirk, this would be for both of y'all. Uh, you know, there's one thing, <clears throat> I hope I haven't missed this. I'm going to miss this Friday night. But there's one thing I, I don't think I've heard it mentioned yet. And uh, you're talking about decadence in Greece and Rome and decadence in modern America. Uh, we've got something that they didn't have, and it's got to be having a tremendous effect. And that's the mass media. Be able to comment on the uh, how was uh, how were decadent uh, morals and, and whatever transmitted in Greece and Rome, and you know how, how does the mass media today have an effect on this? Proceed. Um, you're you're making a good point that uh, degeneracy in the leadership class was less easily spread in the ancient world than it is today. And that's definitely a problem we, we have. However, the leadership of a society do provide models for the rest of society. There's no question about this. My own opinion is, is that this leadership role is, is far more important in a society's long-term stability and creativity than it's given credit for. And... Um, it's a reason why I'm in favor of leadership, even if they're not perfect personally, at least not going out on boats and getting photographed with girlfriends on their laps. 
Uh, and I think the American people feel more or less the same way. There's definitely a negative factor here. The Roman emperors especially, but the Roman upper class also as a whole, uh, could um, slip and still not have a dramatic, so dramatic effect as it's true in our society. However, the effect was still there. Italy, in Italy itself, Italian society was bound together by a system of patron and clients that stretched from the very top to the very bottom of society. Everybody, except for the very top families, the Claudian family, the Scipionic family, etc., and in the empire, the, the emperors, had somebody on, ahead of them who was a patron and for whom they did favors and they did favors to them in return. Everybody all the way down to the slave level in the reverse situation. And when you were a freed slave, you were still the client of the man who freed you. There was not a total freeing of, of obligation or relationship. From the positive point of view, this meant there was a continual interaction. Even people on the bottom had a runged access to the top. But on the negative point of view, serious degeneracy in the top did infiltrate its way down eventually. Um, the thing is, the, the key word there is probably eventually. Uh, in our society, contempt for ordinary morality and for the religion of our people is communicated dramatically and instantaneously. And it's not helped by the fact that the communicators obviously gloat uh, with glee over what they're doing. So the chances for dramatic changes in society are greater with us, although I guess by the reverse, the chances for dramatic reversal are potentially there too uh, if things were to be modified. And certainly those aspects of the mass media and popular culture which occasionally slip into the right hands, the the happiness with which it's greeted, TV shows about families, uh, movies without prestige but which do paint a positive image of religion, uh, courage, patriotism, their enormous success, show that there's, you know, our people are looking for this kind of thing. Uh, ironically, the mass media would usually prefer to lose money making a degrading film than make money um, making a positive one with the grotesque result that old Frank Capra movies from 40 years ago continue to be taken out en masse from the uh, stores while people uh, ignore the latest hits, uh, non-hits, praised by Gene and Roger for their uh, brilliantness. Um, so you're making a good point, but it's still true. A degenerate aristocracy, a degenerate leadership has an effect. You're quite right to point out that the effect certainly can be more, uh, can operate more rapidly in our society than it could in the ancient world. Malcolm Muggeridge was here for an ISI seminar ten years ago, and this same question was raised. And, uh, um, Muggeridge was so, so dismayed by the decay of modern society, and particularly by television, uh, which uh, made Mr. Muggers himself more famous than before and more affluent. Uh, nevertheless, television says it's utter ruin. We are now undone. Uh, there is no escaping from it. Television will bring about the disintegration of our morals and character and intellect. It's all over. Uh, there's only the world beyond the world. There's only uh, eternity for us. This world is doomed to <laughs> dissolution. And so by the side of my friend Malcolm Muggers, I seem to have a, a, a pillar of sweetness and light and hope and cheerfulness. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it certainly is that we have greater difficulties than any civilization had before. Uh, for example, in Roman times, uh, Greek times, there uh, could be no general sale of pornography because the means were not available for printing it uh, or producing it. Now you can uh, have corruption in every drugstore and an incitement of base and dangerous appetites uh, for commercial profit. So, and, of course, the daily newspaper incites to trivial things and... Uh, and uh, different attitudes and, uh, and uh, wakes uh, appetite for silly sensation. Uh, amazing that we have uh, survived this as uh, well as we can. They way back in the 17th century, when late in the 17th century and early in the 18th century, when newspapers of a sort began to appear. There was great alarm in circles, especially court circles, as to the harm these could do in inciting the public to, a, uh, to rebellion, to... A, acts of, of violence and selfishness and so on. And, and we prided ourselves presently upon abolishing all restrictions and political authority upon papers, but uh, we have to pay the price of that. 
the price of uh, excessive freedom is, is license. And it's now become, of course, very serious indeed. Look at, let me give you one practical example, Detroit. Detroit, some years ago, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, uh, put on uh, uh, demonstrations and uh, picketing of the downtown movie theaters. Uh, because those theaters are showing, showing them what are called superfly pictures, that's the name of one picture, in which they have black heroes who are criminals, criminal heroes who uh, kill, or sell narcotics, or drive big, fast, rapid cars, uh, defy the police, and are successful. Uh, and these were shown all downtown, and the NAACP said you can show from the police records uh, that the very night these uh, films are shown, and uh, the night after, a vast increase in the number of uh, murders and rapes in Detroit. Uh, direct effect upon black teenagers, immediate. And we don't see the most horrible crimes right away. And it dies away if something the next film is shown. And it starts up again. And so they said, we don't want these films shown. We don't want any more Super 5 films, no more films inciting to crime. Uh, we demand it in favor of black people because these theaters must not show those films. And uh, Battles carried into the courts. The courts ruled against the NAACP. They ruled against them in favor of them, for everything else, but not in this case. They, oh no, it's absolute freedom of expression. Absolute freedom of expression. But mustn't do, mustn't picket these unfortunate theaters anymore. Then the, the, the NAACP appealed to the uh, uh, to the morale, the moral sense of the, of the theater operators. What, what are you doing? Why are you doing this to us? We're the chief sufferers. Why, why do you have to show these films? Why, uh, why can't you show other films? Because well, these make money, that's why. That was their answer. And uh, they, they're still showing that sort of film when they, when they like. So the means of immediately producing a disintegration society are now available and, uh, and protected um, under the First Amendment, Fifth Amendment, other provisions protected by the laws, the means of actually destroying a society. So the need this Constitution is regarded as a suicide pact, contrary to the expressed intention of a famous justice in the Supreme Court. You mentioned yesterday that the Emperor Augustus brought a restoration of Roman virtues to Roman government. Uh, and you also mentioned that he's from the middle class. Is there something about the middle class that is inherently resistant to decadence? Um, <laughs> uh, th there's no good news there. I, I don't think anybody is inherently resistant to decadence. Uh, resisting decadence is an act of will. And... Uh, it's just true that the more money and more power you have access to, the more tempted you are. And so there'll always be, if you read the novels of Sir Walter Scott, the poor people are more virtuous than the middle level people who are more virtuous than the upper class as a whole. Or if you see uh, Gone with the Wind, uh, Mammy is the most virtuous person in the film, and then uh, we move sort of up the scale with... Uh, wealth and um, power and beauty uh, being attached in this strange way, but it's not because there are not virtuous, wealthy, and beautiful people and unvirtuous um, poor people. Uh, quite the contrary. One time I was in Rome with a good friend of mine who is a communist, and we were all, a whole bunch of us were eating out, and he was, um, it's sort of mugged in a way very common in Italy. Two people ride by on a motorbike, one directs the motorbike, and the other grabs the purse. And with the tight Italian pants they wear, men carry these purses too, not just uh, not just women. Fortunately, my friend being an academic, the, the bag was, uh, the strap was worn. So all they got was the strap and not, not the bag. But it was still an upsetting experience, and we sat down there, and... Um, being upset, you don't always say what you really think, but sort of the tape recorder in your mind, you began to explain about how poverty drives people to, to do these things. And I said, oh, Mario is a good communist. Do you think it's true that the lower class is more corrupt than the upper class? No, the upper class is much more corrupt than the lower class. <laughs> <laughs> said, well, uh, uh, ma, so far. Uh, uh, well, then where goes the theory? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to go along with you on this one. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> How can poverty cause crime if the rich are more corrupt than the than the bottom? It just doesn't work that way. Um, mm -hmm. Middle class tends to be both in sight of the bottom, but also with a reasonable amount of the uh, ability to develop certain kind of graces and, and, and time. That's all. Uh, but a, a society. 
and upper class people are tempted in a way that middle class and lower class people are not tempted. It means that the excellent leader is going to be far more excellent, in fact. And Burke's great statements about it in aristocracy remain true. But Jefferson and Adams' statements on aristocracy, that an aristocracy is composed of people who behave like aristocrats, who are leaders, and it doesn't matter where they come from. There will always be an aristocracy. There will always be leadership. Uh, that can't be abolished, no matter how hard they try. Uh, so I, I don't think that there's anything inherent in it. What is inherent is the situation of the middle class is less likely to be immediately affected by corruption than the upper class. But it, it is possible to corrupt the middle class, and um, it is possible to corrupt the lower class. And it's possible to see, it's arguable, that England has a healthier lower class and it has an upper class, uh, as far as that goes. That's a reasonable argument. And I think Italy is a reasonable argument, too. So. I don't, um, I don't especially see that as, as necessary. I do see it, however, as likely, and we shouldn't be surprised, that when an upper class has reneged on its obligations and sold out, that uh, the middle class will come up. It doesn't surprise me that Julius Caesar, who was such a well-educated person, saw through the morality of his own age and was not bound by it, and that his adopted son didn't have the advantages to see through it and still believed in it and worked to reestablish it in a way that was totally contrary to any rational analysis of the situation. Uh, Julius Caesar, just to take the obvious case, we, we virtually know Caesar intended to institute a monarchy. The Republic had failed. <coughs> Augustus, as everyone points out, analyzes it, set up a virtual monarchy, but he never called it a monarchy. He, he called it the restoration of the Republic. His own powers were confirmed by senatorial vote every five or ten years. You can say it was rigged, but still the conditions of the Republic were still respected at least in outline. And the, to the extent that later Roman emperors ignored those restraints, they did neither themselves nor their country any good, quite frankly, although even so, it was hundreds of years before Roman emperors openly proclaim themselves uh, monarchs and, and, and viewed themselves that way. So I, I wouldn't cling to the praise of the middle class too much. It is true that those of us who are middle class are luckier, let's put it that way. Um, and I think we should be thankful for our good luck and take advantage of that good luck. Uh, what's uh, Randolph of Roanoke's great statement is, I, I'm an aristocrat. I, I I love liberty. I hate equality. I hate equality. Maybe I, I, I can say I'm I'm middle class. I love virtue. I hate equality. Um, and as long as there are enough of people who have those different perspectives, just hating equality isn't enough. Of course, one needs one needs the loving part too. Um, one can society is still going to be in good shape. That would be my own comment. Yes. Sir. Yeah, uh, it, it's it, it's a good question. Uh, part of our difficulties is we're not agreed on what education is supposed to do. There's a real split in it as um, propagandizing for a new order, propagandizing for our old order, which for some reason ends up being in the 1950s of all the times in the world, the back to basics uh, people. Um, raising an educated elite who will be able to provide leadership, just making sure that everybody can read TV Guide and the want ads. And you can sort of go, in fact, a, a couple of years ago, a Denver columnist found out how many uh, young ladies in high school were having babies and said, our school should teach them not to have babies when they're teenagers. And I thought, well, there's, I don't know what subject that was going to be. History, biology, uh, you know, social studies. <laughs> Make it the Department of Social Diseases instead. You know. um, so we, 
We have two problems. The collapse of education is also focused on the collapse of, of what education is for. Actually, if education is for what the uh, National Education Association wants, then it's not collapsing. It's getting better and better every day uh, in every way. I think we have a problem. Julius Caesar was educated to be a leader. He, and he was a leader in the sense that his, he won his battles, he got his bills through. You know, I mean, in terms of the sheer technique of leadership, he was a properly trained person. The collapse of his moral center, the loss of his religion, uh, was uh, a disaster. There's a great passage in Salus' History of the Catalinarian Conspiracy. They, they, they've captured a whole bunch of these people in Rome, and Cicero, as consul, wants a debate that will allow him to execute them as no longer being citizens but enemies of the Republic. And two people speak who... At first, people agree with Cicero. Then Julius Caesar stands up and says, we should do something, I think, not kill them. We should exile them to the most remote parts of Italy where there is no culture, where there's no civic life, where there's no cable, and <laughs> make them live their lives there, and that'll be the worst thing that can happen to them, and that'll be worse than killing them. Of course, it was a crypto defense of them, as everyone knew, but still it was persuasively argued. And after a lot of people voted with Caesar, then stood up one of the tribune of the plebs, who was Cato, the grandson of the great Cato the Elder, who said, and I am obviously not quoting the Latin exactly, uh, according to my friend Mr. Caesar, the worst thing that can happen to someone is to be condemned to uh, live their life in Remus, Michigan. Um, mm -hmm. However, uh, when I went to Sunday school, I heard a different story about what happened to bad people after they died. And that is what happens to evil people who die, according to our religion, is far worse than being forced to live in remote towns in Italy. And people should know that it's not only death, but what happens after death as well is part of the responsibility and fate of people who deny their, their betray, betray their country. And the Senate all said, yeah, well, that is what we're supposed to believe, isn't it? And they changed again to voting the death penalty for these people. Uh, both Cato and Caesar were well-educated people. One of them had simply rejected the morality and religion of his people. The other hadn't. And there's no question that um, eventually Augustus, who rose to power as the adopted son of Julius Caesar, ended up defending the policies of Cato, not of, uh, not of Julius Caesar. Um, I wouldn't worry so much about the collapse of our education as its lack of focus. The fact that we're not educating people to understand our own society, to understand our own moral system, and to understand our own religion. And so people are growing up with a lot of years of education and with great abilities as far as um, free thinking and openness goes, but in fact um, strangers, aliens in their own society. And it's just as bad as one of these movies, you know, where the guy wakes up in the beginning of the movie and he can't remember who he is. And he spends the whole movie trying to find out who he is. And is he a killer? Is he, uh, is he a saint? Actually, none of his actions make any sense until you know what your previous life was. Even your good actions may not be good, depending on what you were before. And a person, a, a person in society has exactly the same past. And what our education is doing by cutting us off from that past is making that even our good actions, how do we know they're good? They're only good in terms of some of where you're coming from and where you're going. And I see that as being sort of the more catastrophic thing than the dropping of this requirement or the usually languages or history or the adding of this requirement, usually sensitivity to uh, some minority or cultural diversity, I guess it's usually called nowadays. That would be my response. No one wanted to discuss what are the ends of education. 
and there was absolutely no philosophical disposition to that discussion. Uh, in other words, they, there was nobody that wanted to discuss the question of wisdom and virtue, and so consequently, whenever I would bring up that point, they would uh, sort of make jokes and say, oh, that's missed wisdom and virtue, you say. And, uh, you know, then, of course, I would ex explain, and, and, and Governor Cleve and a few others on the commission were very uh, agreeable to it, but yet not feeling to the extent that they could push that uh, point. Um, the other thing is that uh, we discussed for some months uh, the question of excellence in education, curriculum reform, and all the rest of it, without ever speaking about the fact that cheating in schools or stealing, and so that finally I said, well, you know, can you really have excellence without intellectual and moral integrity? We forgot that part. And so they, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they just forgot that, and so constantly the report does have, excellence cannot be achieved without intellectual and moral integrity. Okay. And so, they put that part in. And, I mean, one of the things I'm, I'm pointing out is that when you're writing a political report, which is essentially the type of thing that does get attention in this country, yeah. is, you have to use this jargon, these words, even though that was supposedly jargon for it. But the other thing is that you have to appeal to the business mind. And that is why our report says that if a foreign nation had done this to us or the military mind, whichever, uh, that we would have, um, what did you say, we would have. Uh, foreign nation had done regarded it as an act of war. Active war, exactly. <laughs> and uh, they had done it. And we speak always in terms of technology and business and our exports, imports, and all this kind of business is upset because the kids can't read and write. And no discussion at all of any of the moral questions, although sort of something thrown at it, I think, a few phrases that Governor Keen and I were able to put in. But, you know, where do we begin, Chris? You're in the academic world, and if we don't have people who are thinking these first questions, it doesn't seem to me to be an accident that uh, of Albert J. Knox's books, the almost all of them are in print. Usually, the libertarians have them in print, including things like *Our Enemy, the State*. <laughs> <laughs> but his greatest work, and it's a real short book, is called *The Theory of Education in the United States*. And he says we have all these proposals for reform. All right, this was what the late twenties, the Page Barber lectures in the late twenties. Um, we have all these theories for reform, specific recommendations, but what is the theory that lies behind them? He says, this is going to be the only discussion you'll ever hear on this, and that prophecy has so far been virtually uh, true. You can still find it buried in the bottom of, the, of libraries where the Deweys still haven't been converted to the, to the Library of Congress thing yet. Mm -hmm. And he tells this great story I've never forgotten. He says he was talking to the president of a college. I think it seems to be Nicholas Murray Butler, president of Columbia. And Butler was talking about the French house. He said, we have a whole house where the people go there and they speak French and they have their meals and they talk French and everything is done in French. And Knox said, what do they say when they talk French? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Nicholas Murray Butler just sort of looked at him. <laughs> it had, the question never occurred to him. It was so wonderful that they had a technique to get people saying, passez-moi le beurre, and things like this, <laughs> you know. And this was supposed to be so wonderful. And, of course, uh, this is what you try, there's a whole group in language studies, you know, who want us to do oral proficiency, which is to make sure that everybody can say, is there a room free in the hotel? When is the next train for Dieppe? All the rest of these things, but who can't read can't understand the culture. And I always like to drive my French teacher friends nuts by saying, given the example of Edmund Burke, this guy pronounced French the way he pronounced English, which means he had a god-awful Irish accent, presumably. <laughs> he had spent a little bit of time in France. Basically, he knew the great works of French literature. He wrote in 1792 a work that predicted the course of French history for the coming 10 years years all the way down to Napoleon. Without any oral proficiency, he would have, they would have laughed at him in Paris mm -hmm. as far as his pronunciation went, as his <coughs> French E and his French R and all the rest of these things. He had no command over it. But because he knew the literature and because he had a real education that was rooted, came from somewhere and was going somewhere, he could read what was happening in France and say, hey, you guys are going to go through A, B, and C. And there's nothing more impressive than seeing our present currents of the political world who are perpetually baffled by what's going to happen because they have all, they have ten times the information 
that Burke ever had about France, but they are, they are uneducated in a sort of profound sense. Their education has never rooted them in their own world, and therefore they can't understand anybody else's world. But to go up to people, uh, I've served on a couple of these committees. Our school was redoing its curriculum. And so uh, out of perversity, I was nominated for the co-chairman of the Committee on Cultural and Sexual Diversity. <laughs> and because it would look good, you had to be a co-chairman because that would be one man and one woman, right? You know, so that was obvious. <laughs> And I had attended this meeting just here to get a few yucks, you know. <laughs> and the dean who was over supervising this knew what was happening, but, you know, the, I was the only man there, actually. And so uh, I thought it would look good on my dossier, you know, like could show that I wasn't narrow-minded, right? <laughs> but it was, the, the, there were two great problems uh, with the whole thing. One is that when we first set up subcommittees, one to do culture and the other to do sexual diversity, the men and the women split right down the middle, uh, thereby indicating that actually there were different interests that men and women have, which when they found out they were horrified and so made the two co-chairmen sit as the only man and the only woman on the two subcommittees. The other is <laughs> the men wanted to do the cultural things, which was really historical, and the women wanted to run the the, uh, and the two goal statements are <laughs> very bizarre. So I had to sit there and listen to all this crazy ranting and raving. Um, but secondly, you ask, what is the point? What, what, what are we trying to do? And trying to bring up issues like teach people to question, to look at both sides of an issue, to be able to read a book on this topic and come away from it with the distinctions between the author's viewpoint and the factual basis. Well, I, of course, I sounded like a little, in fact, I sounded as though what they took me to be doing, which was to subvert the point of the requirement. The point of the requirement was to propagandize undergraduates in the correct point of view. And even to mention the things I was mentioning was to show a purposeful sabotaging of the point of the requirement, which was propaganda. And... Um, what is to be done in the university uh, is a very serious question when what we've seen is uh, the implanting of a small but significant group of people who are committed, in fact, to the sabotaging of the traditional goals of a liberal education. I was at the National Association of Scholars meeting in, in New York, uh, beginning of November, middle of November there, and the place, of course, was full of academic mug liberals, people who were perfectly happy in 1961 with the way things were going. But then they did have some self-respect. They had some publication. They had some idea that there is a difference between what I feel like this morning and what the facts will show. Within literature, some respect to, to, to the text and the attempt to communicate with the author. And they were now being told that the point of education is to make sure that young people get out of school filled with the right party line. Now, um, in one sense, my own experience is that it doesn't take long for those who get out of school with the right party line to learn the horrible facts of life. I had dinner once with a young lady who went through our political science department. And her favorite teacher was a good friend of mine, a guy who often wins teaching awards and stuff like, like that. And she said, she told about the horrible thing that happened to her because she didn't take an academic job, but a job in a real estate firm. And then came the end of the first month, and I looked at my paycheck, and I started to cry. They'd taken all my money away. <laughs> Dennis never told me where the money came from for all these things. <laughs> well, her boyfriend and I sort of looked at one another, you know, the instant conversion to conservatism. <laughs> 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 Four years of propaganda down the drain, you know. <laughs> and, of course, uh, that's one reason, however, why the sort of the group in academia is, is really, uh, it, I've, I've compared it uh, before to the Indian ghost dance. Uh, among the last resistant movements of the American Indians, of a small group of them, was a leader who, when everything was lost, told them that if they danced the ghost dance, white man's bullets would not hurt them. And some of the really catastrophic quotes, massacres, unquote, not all of them, onions, but some of them were caused by these poor people dancing the ghost dance and then charging with tomahawks, soldiers with rifles. And unfortunately, that particular idea was not true. And we see people now in academia doing what I call the liberal ghost dance, continually telling them that if they continue to go through the ritual 
then reality will not affect them, that they can abolish the family, they can abolish class, that leadership won't be necessary, that equality will reign over the face of the earth. And there, the good news for them is they can create their departments after their own image, but the bad news is their students go out into the world and charge with their little tomahawks against reality, and you know there's no difference between the sexes. And then the women have two babies and one's male and one's female, and you discover already kicking inside you there's a difference. Never mind once they get older and older, and they develop differently. They just do. And that class and background and education and on and on and on, all the realities that can't be abrogated by taking a course or reading a textbook. But um, it is a real problem that we do have this group in academia which most academics know it's wrong, Many administrators know it's wrong, but the environment there, unlike the rest of society, allows them to play games that are very unfortunate because they waste the time of young people who need to have the time to devote to learning about their own past and are being cut off from it, wasting their time learning about a ritual which they're going to learn is true within six months after their departure from our protected stronghold on the outskirts of reality. Yes? I'm thinking about some of the recent examples of the decadence within education. Uh, for instance, the uh, new program at Stanford, which exempts them from studying Western civilization as a whole. Uh, and wondering whether we can't nicely compare presidents of these universities to some of those Roman emperors who saw, had a very shallow view of the state. Uh, faculty members tend to view their own respective departments uh, with a lot of uh, respect, and so they pursue their own interests within the university. But the presidents have a special responsibility to the direction of education. Where, where is the responsibility gone? Uh, it seems to me that in our day of huge universities, or multi-universities as one author put it, um, they have a huge amount of power, and the power corrupts. And so they're, in order to hold on to their authority and their influence, uh, they give in to these moral undercurrents. So they don't see a moral picture anymore. It's just uh, this politics with the academicians who pursue these kind of grievances. Just as the just as the Roman emperor you, uh, you were speaking of before only saw his army as the important factor. As long as you keep an army, you hold power. Okay. Well, I mean that that isn't a question. It's a very good statement. Uh, the role of the college president in the great founding days of American universities was superb, and they ought to be among the heroes of American culture. President Gilman, who founded Johns Hopkins, uh, William Rainey Harper, who founded the University of Chicago, were themselves scholars and themselves aimed at creating great institutions with, uh, to go on the other side, M. Carey Thomas, the first dean and then second president of Bryn Mawr, who created that superb faculty with the ideals that she had. I don't agree with all her ideals, but they were, they were sincere ideals and they involved the highest academic standards and the highest intellectual and moral standards as well. And those institutions were formed by great educated people uh, with a commitment to and a knowledge of and a vision of, let me say that, a vision of an ideal of what it meant to be a human being and the role that liberal arts, uh, humanities, social science and sciences played in the creation. And our presidents nowadays are usually bureaucrats. I will say when I was in New York, I heard uh, President Silber of Boston University speak, and I was impressed that it's still possible to be a college president with a vision. And he simply took um, Milton's ode on his wife. He said, here's a poem about a man missing his late wife. It's a common every day. It's an experience many people get to know through loss. Let's read it. And before you go a couple of lines, there's Alcestis and a few more lines, and there's Hercules. And there's, you can't read even the simplest of the great masterpieces of English literature without needing the past that is there. 
And the way he presented us to us in a way that involved our emotions as well as our intellect, I, I was so impressed by his ability to do that. And there are a few other presidents like that out there. But um, you're absolutely right. The great majority of college presidents are bureaucrats who see themselves as avoiding conflict, which means that small groups of loud people have um, disproportionate power. And the squeaking wheel syndrome has caused many of the unbalances that, uh, that exist. And the refusal to stand up for minimal standards, uh, which we see again and again and again, uh, allows the person who avoids the problems by giving in longer life as an administrator than the person who stands up and takes a firm stand for an ideal that he has. So I entirely agree. The, the collapse of the American college president from a position as a great leader with a vision to a bureaucrat who is not insignificant. Uh, it's not an insignificant factor in our, in our current dilemmas. Let me just offer a few comments on this Western civilization matter, the comments which I haven't seen in other quarters. Uh, doesn't seem to uh, have occurred to most of the champions of the Western Civilization course at Stanford that there really shouldn't be any such course. Uh, that is, there were no such courses in real American universities until after the Second World War. Now, these courses came in with a reduction of uh, entrance requirements. Uh, and before that, it was assumed that uh, students will have a background in history. Uh, by high school, you took three or four years of history right on through high school. And you studied, most, most students studied ancient history, too. And if you were going to college, you studied those things. If you weren't going to college, you didn't have to have all that history. But if you were to college, you expect to have at least three years and probably four. And uh, thus, when you entered college, you didn't have to have a superficial course called History of Civilization, Western Civilization, that be, began with the uh, Neanderthals and uh, came on down to... Uh, President Carter. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 a wild procession of good guys and bad guys shooting it out from age to age, you know. And you identified as you went along. Here's Plato, he's a crypto fascist, too. Now we pass on, uh, and so on. Uh, and, and somehow mixing him up with, uh, with current events, you know, and how they compare the And dash, I've, caught, I've talked this for years. I know the question of civilization course as well. They're frauds, uh, they alienate everybody. Uh, the poorest is totally bewildered and resentful. He has to pass comprehensive examinations on this, and he has no background. He's just a mass of names to him, meaningless, and it's been dashed through. He, and he, uh, he's, all he can do to be the textbook, he probably hasn't read much of it. It's too big and fat, and it's just a collection of names. So he's so hopelessly uh, uh, bewildered and uh, resentful, and he does pour it in the exam, but then he brings the whole average down, so he still passes, because they, they want to pass about everybody who's in it. Uh, and he becomes so, he begins to hate Western civilization. Western Civ, what is this junk? You know? How am I going to use that? And so he wants to, he would like to get up into that course. Then the, the more intelligent are uh, repelled by it because here they wanted to some consideration of grave questions and they want to talk about Plato. Uh, well, we're, we're going on to Aristotle. Now, Plato, as I just told you, is a crypto fascist. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so they're resentful. And they, uh, the, the exam itself is degrading. It's an objective exam. They can't express themselves. Or, uh, and so everybody hates Western civilization, as it's taught in most places. Now, there are some exceptions. Uh, uh, I think that uh, our daughter, uh, Felicia, here apparently has a good course in it, intelligently taught with a great deal. It means a great deal of work by the professor to work with them and, uh, and to uh, make some headway. Uh, but the Washington Lee used to have a good course, uh, not taught by a very good man, a highly egoistic man and a, and a ritualistic liberal, but a good course um, given to a well-educated man, though. Uh, given to uh, seniors, not to freshmen, to seniors. It's an integrating course. You have this course of civilization when you take it all the rest of your courses, and then it has some point and purpose because you're already more or less educated, already have studied history and politics and so on. This brings it together. But very few places have done that. Almost always a freshman course, a makeup course of what you didn't get in high school, uh, like other courses. And so it really is, if you stand for elsewhere, it's pretty hard to defend and you realize what really goes on and what the resentments come from. Obviously, it's still worse to have a, a, a course in. 
African civilization is a substitute and so on. People will understand that still less and they're still more confused. And there is no such thing as a, a pattern of African history or culture. There are many histories and many cultures in Africa, but there isn't a common pattern which would be described. In fact, the term Western civilization itself is an evasion. And that is now on these various treatments of Western civilization, of course, they include Australia and New Zealand, though they aren't in the West. They now include Japan. As part of Western civilization. Well, what's, what, what meaning is this term? This term Western it means well industrialized civilization, something that's not, that's not a good pattern of study as to who's industrialized. Uh, and uh, obviously, it should be called a Christian civilization. But you see, that would be discriminatory. <laughs> uh, that's what we have the Christian civilization, which incorporates great elements from classical civilization and Hebraic civilization. And, you know, Christian elements added, and they form a whole, which was generally called Christian civilization. But that would be, you can't use that term, it's too frightening. You can't even use Judeo Christian, which would be a term not entirely true, but obviously there are, it's dominantly Christian, but there are large Hebraic or Jewish elements in it. But that, that would be too dangerous, uh, be discriminatory. You can't use that, so you call it Western civilization. The formerly people didn't protest against Western. That was in neutral. They, they do object now. Uh, leaving out all the Orientals, leaving out Africa, and so on. Let's have the history of Ghana. Let's, uh, history. That, Ghana keeps coming up, up and again in these courses. Ghana. Let's emphasize Ghana. Ghana and culture, and so on. Uh, no one knows why, except it became a popular term. When the Kwame Nkrumah, who was totally Americanized, was dictator of Ghana, it became popular to talk about Ghana, Ghanaian civilization, the great empires of medieval times, and so on. So in a sense, we're defending something indefensible in the, in the Stanford Western Civilization course. Something is very wrong there. What is proposed as a substitute is worse, but uh, still, the battle shouldn't be fought on a different ground than that. Yeah, but Russell, mm -hmm. people who uh, defend that, for instance, Wall Street Journal, uh, by a businessman or something like that, they don't understand all the complexities no. of what it is you're saying. This group, as your explanation might have to, you know, understand that. You even did say that the report that That's, that's, that's what he thinks, yes. He doesn't know the content of the course. He has been there himself. And, and uh, these eminent leaders in business and politics uh, graduated from college uh, before these things became widely popular. And uh, they don't realize how superficial such a thing is and how little is intelligent can be compressed in, into so hasty a course. Well, let me give you an example. I, I was, uh, many of you know these examples, of course, from present such courses when I was teaching the history of civilization. In theory, we were supposed to teach it by the Socratic method. If you reach using the Socratic method to a class over 100, with the bulldozers roaring outside, uh, most of the bored and resentful of being there, the Socratic method, they're supposed to question back and forth. They cover the whole history of civilization. You do Rome in three days on the Socratic method, <laughs> examining these things. Uh, well, I, so then we give these solemn tests, always objective. Uh, I would give essay exams, unlike my colleagues, in order to try to put some sense into it. And I'd ask for have brief written responses. Which ask questions like this. Uh, describe Egyptian sculpture. Here's the answer. Egyptian sculpture was mostly horizontal. They all had that oriental look. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then there was, uh, describe the, uh, the career of Augustine of Hippo. Augustine was a man, no, Augustine was a boy who had a Christian mother and a pagan father. End of description. <laughs> and I painfully go over this, uh, the public or private. Now, I said, what you said is true. Why did you, you, you write me down for that, Professor? I said, well, not what you said. I said, it's in the book. It's in the, it's in the book. Uh, so that's true. It's in the book. And that's uh, only a partial account of <laughs> Augustine's importance. Uh, he did other things and have a father and mother, but he didn't. Uh, <laughs> He, uh, he didn't stay a boy, he <laughs> did grow up. And, uh, and after all, um, probably there are many people today who have Christian mothers and pagan fathers, <laughs> but we don't record them in history for that reason. <laughs> um, oh, then there's a question. Uh, uh, describe the, the work and uh, endeavors of Martin Luther, his principles. Martin Luther was a boy. <laughs> Uh, who, when he was going home on vacation, had a vision on the train. 
in the, uh, the historical sense. They, my students went home in the train. They don't now. They have to go on an airplane now. But they then went home in the train, and that's what, of course, Martin Luther did, because things are always the same. This is all Western civilization, and they always travel on trains, so they always will. <laughs> and they're always boys. Um, and that's the level which these things are conducted at Stanford and elsewhere. And so you're not losing very much when it's lost, except you ought to have something better than that to substitute, not something worse. Well, I think we should turn to the comments by our distinguished guest here. Um, let's turn first to Dr. Sullivan. These um, general questions. I think Tony wanted to go last. All right. That. Yeah, oh, I, okay. I am uh, whatever you want. Well, let's turn then to uh, Mr. Cribb over here. Well, I've gotten here this, this afternoon by cheating. Uh, normally there's someone from the ISI staff in attendance at the Piety Hill seminars, and uh, I was attending as a friend and a, get, a guest and a student, but because I'm an ISI trustee, I'm doing the offices uh, and very pleased to do so. Uh, first of order of business, of course, is to thank the Kirks for once again hosting... Uh, providing an unforgettable uh, experience for us in terms of content and form. And uh, for the content, we owe all to Dr. Kirk. And for the form, we all, all owe all to Mrs. Kirk. The importance of form is a peculiarly conservative insight in modern days. And uh, at the concert last night, I was sitting up on the stairs. I could see most of your faces. And I was could see the expressions on your faces, and I was thinking how much the form adds to our endeavor. And what I thought of more than anything else was uh, a poem by Yeats called uh, Prayer for My Daughter, and I found it this morning. And the whole poem is apt, but I'm going to read only a few lines. Uh, Yeats, when he collected his poems, put them in rough chronological order, but not strict chronological order, and he means them to inform each other by their placement in the volume. The one that precedes a prayer for my daughter is the famous one you've all heard of, the, the second coming. And the chaos that he describes in the second coming is a, is a, a, a macro chaos. It's a, it's a cultural chaos. And he is providing a personal response to that chaos. What can one man do what, to shore up fragments of the ruins? And, uh, and the poem that results is a prayer for my daughter. And uh, this, is, I'm, this is how he concludes it. Uh, and may her bridegroom bring her to a house where all is accustomed, ceremonious. For arrogance and hatred are the wares peddled in the thoroughfares. How but in custom and in ceremony are innocence and beauty born. <coughs> so we've had a taste of custom and ceremony, and it's had a lot to do with what we will take away from our more intellectual discussions, and for that we will always be grateful to Annette. But my real purpose here is to say a little bit about ISI and what it has to do with what we've done this weekend, which I'm sure is puzzling some of you. <laughs> uh, in fact, ISI and, and Dr. Kirk have really always been connected. Uh, in fact, ISI was founded in the year that, uh, same year that Dr. Kirk's early major work, The Conservative Mind, was published in 1953. And it's easy to forget in the midst of this current muscular revival of uh, conservatism how bleak prospects were uh, for conservatism back in those years. In fact, uh, an early working title of your book was The Conservative Route, was it not? Yeah. Before, before it was finally named The Conservative Mind. And, uh, and the route of conservatism had been fairly complete. Uh, Dr. Kirk is fond of quoting uh, Henshaw to the effect that conservatives prefer to sit and think, or sometimes just sit. <laughs> And certainly, uh, conservatives had sat out the great uh, uh, intellectual turmoil of the 1930s and 1940s, so that by 1950, Lionel Trilling could write with some justification that liberalism was not only the dominant uh, intellectual tradition in America, but the sole intellectual tradition in America. But Trilling didn't know what Disraeli knew, that uh, prevailing views are the views of the generation that is passing. And by 1950, uh, Friedrich Hayek had written the 
The Road to Serfdom, and it was available in a popular book of the month club uh, volume in the United States. Uh, uh, Richard Weaver had written, uh, Ideas Have Consequences. Uh, Even as he spoke in 1950, Henry Regnery, the chairman of ISI now, but the publisher Henry Regnery had published Bill Buckley's first book, God and Man at Yale. But then in that year of 1953, the year ISI was founded, conservatism, intellectual conservatism, became self-conscious and overt with the publication of The Conservative Mind by Dr. Kirk, a book that uh, named the movement, which has now gathered force until it is one uh, national political power in the person of a self-conscious and self-named movement conservative, Ronald Reagan. But casting our minds back again to the 50s, uh, how, were, how were new generations of students to be introduced uh, to conservative thinkers like Dr. Kerr, uh, who were a reviving interest in the great traditional learning of the West? Well, it wouldn't be through the universities. Those were in enemy hands and, and still are to a large extent. And that's, that's where ISI comes in. Uh, ISI was founded as a mediating institution to encourage conservative authors to write and to speak on the one hand, and on the other hand, to introduce the, the writings and speeches of conservative authors uh, to the brightest minds of each succeeding college and university generation. Now, ISI does this through its, its publications, like the Intercollegiate Review, Modern Age, Political Science Reviewer, continuity through its book program in which it it uh, republishes conservative classics and also brings out new works such as the the collection of essays and celebration of Niemeyer that uh, has just come out but in addition to those scholarly offerings it uh, it runs an extensive field program and some of you have been involved in that and and it runs a field program in the sense of, of campus-based activity. It has 200 lectures a year, uh, a number of seminars, uh, the seminars at Piety Hill, I think, being the best of them, uh, the uh, summer schools. But why, why, why is ISI's emphasis on college and universities? Why is it campus-based? And I think we have been, been in part discussing that uh, all weekend and more, and more sharply in the past few minutes. And it is because education should at least in in part involve uh, the transmission of our cultural heritage. Uh, And in our time, universities are failing in that part of that task, so crucial to the very existence, our our, our continued existence, of culture itself. And then why ISI's emphasis, so that's why the the emphasis is campus-based. Why is, is the emphasis on conservative thought? And that is because it's conservative thinkers uh, who are trying to freshen the colors of that fresco that uh, Dr. Kirk uh, quoted Cicero in in describing earlier. Uh, That the the tradition uh, that uh, Professor Kopf described beginning with home and continuing uninterrupted really until, until the Enlightenment. The conservative thinkers in our time are trying to restore those connections that uh, the, the, that were interrupted uh, with the rise of of, uh, of the Enlightenment, uh, connections that were broken, then uh, severed by the guillotine, and and now but the successors in our own century uh, are still battering those connections. So restoring connections is can be is a good. Uh, synoptic term for what the ISI's mission is, what its purpose is, and I think we've restored a few this this weekend with uh, Dr. Kirk's in, incomparable presentations with the uh, superb lectures by Christian Koff. And on behalf of ISI, I want to, to thank them for what they, and thank you for coming to, to hear them. And the work, but the work is, is ne- never going to be done for ISI, will never be done for Dr. Kirk, for Christian Koff, and for their successors because the defense of the permanent things always has to be put in the lexicon of our own time in history. It's Chambers who reminds us that uh, each age finds its own language for an eternal meaning. Thank you.
now some comments by Dr. Anthony Sullivan. Named, I suppose, after the member of the triumvirate. Without an H in his name. Yeah, that's right. As in Mark. I have been uh, given strict instructions to uh, stay very close to this microphone here, which rather surprised me, and it would surprise my wife, certainly, were she here because of my want to uh, speak very loudly, and uh, I was born with a very loud voice, but I will be very obedient and uh, restrict myself here to the podium. Uh, we have heard uh, over the last two days a good deal about education, perhaps uh, the decadence indeed, which uh, does characterize advanced learning uh, in our time. And uh, uh, certainly all of you here have a good idea of the anomie, I think, perhaps would be the <laughs> way, best way to describe it, of uh, higher uh, uh, education, certainly undergraduate education at most uh, of our institutions today. There's no purpose, it seems, frequently to education. Students drift. Students do their own things. Students don't engage with curricula. Perhaps that's all to the good, given the kind of curricula that they are commonly uh, offered. Faculty members spend time on what's called research. It very frequently is not. Sometimes I think it's a kind of nervous distraction to faculty, what they spend their time doing. And the entire enterprise drifts. I spent many years overseas. I came back as a graduate student myself to a very large university in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And the dramatic difference that I noticed in the late 1960s, which was a terrible time to be doing graduate study, uh, about eight or ten years after I had finished my undergraduate work, that was, I hate to admit it, going back into the 1950s when there was some kind of vestigial saving remnant, at least at the school that I attended, there was some kind of a core curriculum that uh, remained there. Then I came back the university was burning down almost literally. Um, there was no interest in serious study. There was no interest in individual students. And one person adopted me, a man by the name of Stephen Tonser, uh, who has been for many, many years very close to ISI. And as a matter of fact, the first time I heard about the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, it was from Stephen Tonser on many long walks back to his home from the university to have lunch with him. And that was a very important part of my own graduate education. I mention all of this simply to suggest to you that this weekend I have been really impressed, really struck by the community which the Wizard of Macosta and the Mistress of the Revels have succeeded in creating here in Macosta, community on the one hand and caring and concern on the other. And the, the synthesis of scholarship and education, I think with a wider concern with the individual, with personhood, and with individual development. Mr. Cribb mentioned the string quartet last night. I think in, in many ways that symbolized all of this pulling together and this integrity and this, this corporate approach in the very best sense. Let me turn now to a, a very brief remark or two about the institution that I represent, Earhart Foundation, and specifically what we do and our connection with the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Earhart Foundation is entirely involved in the support of advanced research, advanced scholarship, Historically and primarily in what we call the related fields of economics and political science. We started off in economics for very good reasons in the 1950s and 1960s, supporting graduate study. We don't do any undergraduate support for students on that level, but graduate students and people with the PhD to do research uh, in economics on the one hand and political science read political philosophy, political theory on the other. And that's what we've been doing for about 25 or 30 years now, making grants to students to get degrees 
and to uh, faculty members to do research. You see, we're part of the problem, of course, here. Supporting people to do this thing that's called uh, research. Uh, recently, we have been developing a, a concern, and I'm trying to push this forward, with humane letters, with English, with literature, with history in a broader sense. Uh, we have even done uh, a bit of experimentation in the field, don't panic, uh, of sociology uh, in the sort of tradition of Professor Edward Schills at the University of Chicago, which is a rather different kind of sociology that one, than, one often, uh, than one often encounters. Uh, in all of this, we have found one of the most effective vehicles through which serious scholarship first-class education and the advancement of a free society can be affected is our work with the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Earhart Foundation has been a supporter of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute from the late 1950s and uh, since about 1964 we have put major resources into a program that Mr. Cribb didn't mention um, one of, I think, the finest programs of ISI, the Weaver Fellowship Program for Advanced Study. And one of the great mysteries that I've never been able to understand is why there is not more support for the Weaver Fellowship Program. There are some 15 or 18 of these fellowships that I think still pay something like $2,500 for graduate school tuition or stipend, rather, and plus uh, tuition, whatever the uh, tuition is at the school that a student is attending. But uh, there should be 50 Weaver Fellowships or 100 Weaver Fellowships. And uh, uh, we think that that program, that scholarship program, fellowship program at the Intercollegiate Studies Institute has been of enormous success. And Mr. Cribb would tell you if you look around Washington today and, or the last eight years during the Reagan administration, people in so many places who have played a very important role in the restoration to the extent that it's occurred of sound policy in this our republic have been many of them Weaver Fellows and even a larger number in some way associated with ISI. So ISI, which has given us, which has helped our leaders to present this wonderful seminar this weekend, has done many things, many important things over a long period of time to restore in this republic values and standards that we all support, that we all believe in, and may it long flourish, may it long continue, and thank you, Russell. Thank you, Annette. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Paul.